right? This was a really interesting story. Open source learning might be the future of education, but there's still that problem of quality control. I think that's a significant problem. I'm having some doubts on this. So I set out to find out how to start this learning revolution. That's what I want to talk with you about now in the next 18 minutes. And to be honest, I'm quite glad that I'm having this talk in front of engineers at a technical technological university. And I'll tell you why. It's because 200 years ago, people revered engineers. Engineers were changing the face of the planet. Now, if we want a revolution, we look towards politicians. I am going to show you guys that engineers can, and again will, cause revolutions. In fact, I'm kind of curious, how many engineers do we have here, or how many of you are becoming engineers? Can I see some hands? That's most of you, I like that. In fact, I like engineers, it's because they are so diverse. You all love solving problems, and you, also, you all do so in very different and unconventional ways. I can give you an example of that. A few years ago at my house, we had a mouse problem. And normal people would go to the store, buy a mouse trap, but no, not we. My housemates and I, we set out to build the best mouse trap ever. We get a complicated electrical system, huge transformers, a massive potential field. And in the end, we managed to kill one mouse, which actually was the wireless computer mouse next door. <laughs> now, I myself started to become an engineer about five years ago. I started studying aerospace engineering here at this university, and I was really enthusiastic. For every course that I took, I wrote a summary, worked it out on my computer, it looked brilliant. And then one day something terrible happened, my friends found out. They all wanted to have those summaries, and normal people would of course send them those summaries. But no, not I, I was already in the engineering mood. What I did was I built a website and I put the summaries on there. I called the website aerostudents.com. Then some months later, something strange started happening. I started getting emails through that website, spontaneous emails. Not only from aerospace engineering, not only from Delft but from around the world. They were thanking me for my summaries, for my website. And uh, to be honest, I was kind of shocked by that. In fact, I was just trying to help out a few friends. I didn't intend to help people around the world. When I get out of this university, I might have a doctor's degree, but I'm not the kind of doctor that actually helps people. I was feeling really uncomfortable here. I started wondering, why is this happening? Why do they like my summaries so much? And I didn't have a clue until I was watching a TED movie online by Ken Robinson. <laughs> Ken Robinson is an expert in the field of education, and this is what he told me. I think we have to recognize a couple of things here. One is that human talent is tremendously diverse. People have very different aptitudes. I worked out recently that I was given a, a guitar as a kid at about the same time that Eric Clapton got his first guitar. <laughs> you know, it worked out for Eric, that's all I'm saying. You know, <laughs> in a way, it did not for me. I could not get this thing to work, you know. No matter how often and how hard I blew into it, you know, it just <laughs> wouldn't work. So what he's saying is that people have very different aptitudes. Every student is different. This is what I now call the law of student diversity. Everyone learns in a different way. Some people like to read books. Others like to listen to lectures. There were those that preferred dense summaries. And those were the students that were sending me those emails. So this law of student diversity, how do we take that into account? How do we deal with it? That is something that Ken Robinson also explained to me. We have to go from what is essentially an industrial model of education, a manufacturing model, which is based on linearity and conformity and batching people. We have to move to a model that is based more on principles of agriculture. We have to recognize that human flourishing is not a mechanical process, it's an organic process. And you cannot predict the outcome of human development. All you can do is, like a farmer, is create the conditions under which they will begin to flourish. So when we look at reforming education and transforming it, it isn't like cloning a system. There are great ones, like KIPS, it's a great system. There are many great um, models. It's about customizing them to your circumstances and personalizing education to the people you're actually teaching. So let me summarize what we need to do is we need to personalize education to every individual student. At the moment, in our current educational system, we are manufacturing students. We're giving them all the same lectures, the same books. We need to give education personalized to every individual. That is something that I wanted to accomplish. So I set out to start this learning revolution. There was only one problem, though. We have several million people in the Netherlands alone taking education. How can we 
individually personalized education to every one of them. I didn't have a clue. Until sometime later, I was watching another TED movie, and this one was by Salman Khan. Salman Khan founded the Khan Academy, and what they do is they make a lot of short educational movies, videos of about 10 minutes each, about a variety of topics, maths, physics, history, finances, everything. These videos are being watched by a million people daily. If you think my website is good, the Khan Academy will blow you away. And recently they're taking things to the next level. They are working together with schools to integrate their videos into the curriculum. Children then watch these videos at home, and then when they go to the classroom, something really fascinating happens. Salman Khan will tell you a bit more about that. But the more interesting thing, and this is the unintuitive thing when you talk about technology in the classroom, by removing the one-size-fits-all lecture from the classroom and letting, and letting students have a self-paced lecture at home, and then when you go to the classroom, letting them do work, having the, the teacher walk around, having the peers actually be able to interact with each other, these teachers have used technology to humanize the classroom. They took a fundamentally dehumanizing experience, a bunch of th 30 kids with their fingers on their lips, not allowed to interact with each other. A teacher, no matter how good, has to give this kind of one-size-fits-all lecture to 30 students, you know, blank faces, slightly antagonistic, and now it's a human experience. Now they're actually interacting with each other. Now they're actually interacting with each other, exactly. These videos, they work so well. They're so popular, and why is that? That's what I started wondering. I found out several reasons, the most important one being that they're of very high quality, much higher than that of a normal lecture. And it's actually kind of logical. I used to teach here at this university. When I gave a lecture for 40 students, I couldn't prepare for that for a whole week. In fact, if I would spend a whole week preparing my lecture, they would probably fire me. But Salman Khan, his videos are being watched by millions of people. He can spend an entire week to prepare a short 10-minute video. That is why it's of so high quality. And what's even better, his videos aren't only watched today, they will be watched tomorrow, and the day after, and the year after, for countless of generations. If Isaac Newton had done YouTube videos on calculus, <laughs> I wouldn't have to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, the point is, if we develop educational materials for very large groups of students, then we can afford to make it very high quality. This is what I now call the law of large numbers. We should develop educational materials for huge groups of students. But still, this Khan Academy was not the solution to my quest. It's not perfect. In fact, it does not work for me. When I listen to a talking person, I lose focus after three minutes. I tried this Khan Academy. After three minutes, I just lost it. I'm a good reader. I love reading books. I absorb huge books of information quickly but I'm just not a listener, and with me, there are many more like me. So, this Khan Academy does not satisfy the law of student diversity. It is not the solution to my quests. So, I was having a bit of a problem here. On one hand, there's the law of student diversity. We need to personalize education to the individual. On the other hand, we have the law of large numbers. We need to give education to huge groups. How do we combine it? For a while, I thought we can't. This whole quest of mine to start the, lever the learning revolution was not going to happen. Until one night, I got an idea. And in fact, I wasn't watching a TED movie. It was night, I was sleeping. But I woke up, and I realized that Ken Robinson is wrong. We shouldn't be personalizing education to every individual, because that's just impossible. What I realized is that we should let students adapt education to themselves. We should enable students to change the way they get education to their own preferences. Of course, we should still give education to huge groups of students. The law of large numbers still holds. But we should allow these students to change that education to the way that works best for them, according to the law of student diversity. If we do that, many students will learn a lot better, and the amount of dropouts will significantly decrease. So how do we implement something like this? Well, there are many ways in which we can implement it. I am going to tell you guys how I am implementing it. What I am doing is I'm designing a computer program that can teach. And it can teach in different ways based on the user. The user can set how it teaches. 
I will demonstrate it to you now. Let's say you guys are learning the geometric progression. The main part of my computer program is a timeline. And this timeline is just like in a movie. It indicates the progress. It even has a progress marker. But what is special is that it's split up into blocks. These blocks indicate parts of an explanation. For example, we have background information, a problem statement first, some derivation, a problem solution, and in the end, some examples. You, as a user, can set how much you want of each of these. For that, we have the preferences box. I already know a bit about geometric progressions, so I don't need to know much about the problem statement. So let's summarize that. We move the red slider to the left, and the red block decreases in size. I like additional information. I like derivations. The problem solution, I already know a bit about that, so we can summarize that too. For the examples, we have two options. How in-depth are our examples? And how many do we want? So do we go for one big example, three small examples, ten huge examples? It's all possible. Sadly, I don't have time for examples, so I'm sliding that one to zero. We don't have any yellow blocks. But there's more to this program. We can also say how we want information to come to us the information input. If we're watching a movie, we hear spoken voices. But I'm not a, a listener, I'm a reader, so I prefer written text. Of course, you can also do both. Secondly, there is the auto-advance option. Does this movie continue on its own, or doesn't it? Some people just like to sit back and listen. I'm not one of them, I like to be in control. I like to tell the program, okay, I get it. Now we can move on. I put it to off. Thirdly, there is the visuality setting. How visual are the explanations? If it's set to average, it's like your average textbook. Move it to the left, you have almost no visual things, just text. I'm a visual learner, I like pictures. I slide it all the way to the right. Finally, there's the explanation order. Do we go for a bottom-up approach or a top-down approach? I'll explain to you what it means. In a bottom-up approach, we start with a problem statement, and then we build up until we get to the solution. In the top-down approach, we start with the solution and we look where it came from. In fact, this problem solution is this purple box. If we go for a top-down approach, look where it goes. To the left. Some people really like this top-down approach. It works better for them. I'm more of a bottom-up guy though, so I'll set it back to the bottom-up approach. Now let's roll this program. The geometric progression. What is it? In a geometric progression, every number equals the previous number multiplied by your ratio r. And our problem is, if we add up n numbers, what sum do we get? This is, in its summarized form, the problem statement, what we asked for. We move on to the additional information. Where do geometric progressions occur? Note that there are a lot of pictures, because we set the visuality setting to very high. If you move on, we get some more additional information, except at this point I kind of get bored. It's too much additional information. What we can do, we slide the green slider to the left, and additional information is summarized. We can continue with the derivation. How do we find the sum of a geometric series? Well, it's pretty hard, unless we apply a trick. We multiply the series by r, we subtract these two from each other, and this should then give us the solution. What is interesting is that there is quite some text on this slide. If we would have selected spoken voices as information input, this text would not appear on the screen, it would come from our speakers into our ears. We move on to the geometric progression solution. We have two simple lines summarizing the solution. A summary just like we asked for. In a nutshell, this is how the program works. There are many more futures which I'm planning to build into it, but I don't have time to discuss that with you now. What I want to spend my last few mi minutes discussing with you is how this program can change the world. First, let's look at the Netherlands. If this program would appear in the Netherlands, what would happen? Students will be able to learn in their own way. Students will learn better, there will be less dropout. But what about the rest of the world? There is an initiative called a One Laptop Per Child program. This program has as goal to give every child in a developing country a laptop. What would happen if this program would be on those laptops. <coughs> Kids can then teach themselves to become engineers. Or can they? I've seen some hesitant faces. Can children teach themselves? 
don't we need teachers for certain things? That's what I thought too. I believed kids couldn't teach themselves until I found another TED movie. This one was by Sugata Mitra. And what he did was he put a computer in a very far away remote town in India and he watched what happens. The kids in that town, they found the computer, they started playing with it, and after a few hours they were doing cool stuff with that computer. He then got the theory that kids can learn on their own. He's saying something about that and I want to show you that now. <laughs> I wanted to test the limits of this system. The first experiment I did out of Newcastle was actually done in India, and I set myself an impossible target. Can Tamil-speaking 12-year-old children in a South Indian village teach themselves biotechnology in English on their own? And I thought, I'll test them, they'll get a zero, I'll give them material, I'll come back and test them, they'll get another zero, I'll go back and say, yes, we need teachers for certain things. I called in 26 children, they all came in there, and I told them, look, there's some really difficult stuff on this computer. I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't understand anything. Um, it's all in English, and uh, I'm, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> so I left them with it. I came back after two months, and the 26 children marched in looking very, very quiet. I said, well, did you look at any of the stuff? They said, yes, we did. Did you understand anything? No, nothing. So I said, well, how long did you practice on it before you decided that you understood nothing? I said, we look at it every day. So I said, for two months you were looking at stuff you didn't understand. So a 12-year-old girl raises her hand and says, literally, apart from the fact that improper replication of the DNA molecule causes genetic disease, we've understood nothing else. <laughs> uh, this is amazing. He then goes on to explain how kids really can learn well on their own because of their inherent curiosity. And this fact has inspired me so much that I now really want to develop this system. I really want to develop it to enable the readers among us to read, to enable the listeners to listen and the visualizers to visualize. I want to develop this system to enable people dropping out of university to get education in a way that does suit them. I want to develop this system to enable kids in faraway countries to become engineers on their own. I already told you how much I love engineers. Imagine what whole countries filled with engineers can do. Imagine the revolutions that they would cause. But first, I'm going to develop the system. I'm going to do that right here in Delft. The learning revolution will start right here. <laughs>